With the modern state of multiplayer gaming, the concept of pay to win has become a depressingly familiar one. With games like Overwatch 2 giving paying players a distinct advantage, it's nice that TF2 has survived these unfortunate trends in a state of bastion of honesty. Well, mostly, anyway. Despite the weirdness of the item drop system, the game keeps its monetization fair, with unlocks never obsoleting the stock weapons they replace and cosmetics having no actual impact on the game. But whether accidentally or not, there actually are several items in the game that could technically be classified as pay to win since they cost money and give their users a slight advantage. The advantage isn't usually huge, but it is there, and because of that, I think it is an interesting topic to discuss. So what makes an item pay to win? I would define it as something that's a direct upgrade, where it only has advantages over the thing that it's replacing, but is otherwise completely equal. But when I say something is directly better, I mean that it is functionally identical in every other way aside from the benefits. As much as stuff like the shovel is considered worse than the market gardener, there's still an argument to be made for the rare occasion you'd want to use it, say in medieval mode. If the market gardener was truly a direct upgrade, it would do everything the shovel can do, but it would would also have an additional positive. So as far as TF2 goes, there are relatively few weapons that outright obsolete the weapon they're replacing. In fact, the only weapon in the entire game that purposefully does this is the third degree, being identical in every single way except for the addition of the Medibeam damage transfer stat. Does this make the third degree completely overpowered and blatantly unfair to the numerous Fire Axe users? Well, no. It's a pretty niche upgrade that replaces one of the worst weapons in the entire game. But despite that, I do find it interesting how there's still a weapon in the game that's not even pretending to have a downside. While this is the only one of its kind now, the Solemn Vow also used to be in the same boat, being a complete and total upgrade from the Bone Saw with no penalties to speak of. For the first few years it was in the game, there was quite literally zero reason to ever use the Bone Saw in any situation ever. Not that there's much now, but it does at least have the highest DPS out of all of Medic's melee, so at least there's something going for it. They did eventually fix the Solemn Vow in Gunmetal, giving it a completely game-changing 10% slower firing speed. Way to go crazy with balancing, Valve. But that's in the past now, so the only one we have to worry about about anymore is the third degree, which could certainly be worse. But even though there's a single weapon that's purposefully pay to win, there actually are quite a few that could also technically count for one reason or another. The Holy Mackerel, for instance, has a small but present benefit over stock. The hits being displayed in the kill feed, although only supposed to be a cosmetic change, gives the niche utility of detecting dead ringing spies. Naturally, the unarmed combat also falls into this category, however, it is objectively funnier when used for this purpose considering what the weapon actually is. Perhaps a controversial take is that the original is a direct upgrade from the rocket launcher, treating off the invisible benefit of muscle memory for an objectively more consistent projectile. I was a bit hesitant to put this one on here, considering that a lot of people strongly prefer stock when given the choice, but I'd venture to guess that that's mostly down to familiarity, and if given the option, most good soldiers would opt for a center projectile being the default rather than the exception. Not being screwed over by over 50% of the game's corners and having an easier time performing pogos is great, and because of that, I do believe that center projectiles are the superior choice. So, the original counts for the sake of the video. Fight me. Pyro has two interesting weapons that count as direct upgrades that you may not have thought of before. The Rain Blower and the Nostromo Napalmer are, technically speaking, both slightly better versions of stock. The Nostromo Napalmer has the incredibly niche benefits of 1. Having a shorter barrel making camping around corners slightly easier, and 2. Doing way more damage against scouts who happen to have the entire alien set equipped. The latter of these does require you to also be using the MK50, which, let's be honest, you're probably not, but if you ever happen to come across a scout with a full alien loadout, you do have the option to ruin his day very quickly. Again, not a very major upgrade, but compared to stock, the only differences are positive. The Rainblower has a decently better upside of coming packaged with a taunt kill, and not even a horrible one at that. The only problem with the Rainblower is that due to making your game look like this, <laughs> most people prefer not to use it. But again, nothing about Pyroland affects your ability to actually play the game, so the Rainblower is technically a flamethrower reskin with a single additional positive stat. Two more direct upgrades that you've probably heard something about before are the Mutated Milk and Self-Aware Beauty Mark, both of which can be thrown about 5% farther than their counterparts. I'll link a video by Sigseg if you want to learn more, but basically it comes down to the bred versions of the projectile having a slightly higher mass value and therefore more inertia when thrown. Never thought your physics class would help you understand TF2 better, did ya? In the last group of weapons I believe count as direct upgrades are the all-class melee reskins, simply because they don't give any information to the enemy team when they appear in the kill feed. Well, kills with the Kukri alert people that a sniper's on the other team, kills with the Hamshank are pretty machete or pretty ambiguous. Even if this doesn't matter in 99% of situations, there are definitely times that I was able to ambush people effectively after already getting a kill because they didn't know what class I was. Again, not exactly a game-changing upside, but it does come in clutch more often than you'd think. So those are the weapons that can be considered direct upgrades.
upgrades, but there also exists several taunts and cosmetics that also provide a pretty definitive gameplay advantage. Actually, almost every taunt provides you with some sort of benefit, since being able to go into third person and look around corners is very powerful in the right hands. But some taunts are much better for serving this purpose than others, mainly any of them that loop and don't make a lot of noise, so I'm only giving extra credit to the high five and the dances, since they can also be cancelled immediately. Some taunts, like the box trot, can make you incredibly hard to spot, allowing you to blend into the map or otherwise shrink your model to allow hiding in cheeky spots. The looping taunts that allow you to move around like the zoom and broom in the victory lap also have a weird glitch where you can completely cancel your fall damage if you dismount them in midair, which could save you from otherwise hopeless situations. And finally, some taunts like the square dance completely disjoint your hitbox from your model, giving less experienced players an existential crisis when they try to shoot you. So yeah, depending on your definition of the term, a good majority of taunts could actually count as pay to win. What a game. As far as cosmetics go, there are a few that can provide minor annoyances to people by either making it hard to tell what team you're on or making your hitbox a bit obtuse. But those can easily be worked around by experienced players, so calling them direct upgrades would be a bit of a stretch. The true direct upgrade cosmetics are the Saxton Hail Mask and the Horseless Headless Horseman's Head, which both make you completely immune to the Horseman's Stun ability. Why they would make them do this at all is a mystery, but come on, at least tell people that it's a feature of the hat. They don't list this in the game anywhere, and I wouldn't be surprised if this was your first time ever hearing about it. And to wrap up the pay-to-win items, there's the green Halloween fire effect, which you can put on your flamethrowers. This spell makes your flames visually linger on your target for a fair bit longer than they would normally. Even though this doesn't add any extra damage, it does allow you to track cloak spies much easier than you'd otherwise be able to, so it definitely counts as pay-to-win. But as a wise purple man once said, everything should be in balance. With the items that are pay-to-win, there also exists a fair amount of items that are pay-to-lose. So let's go through them too, shall we? In Valve's defense, there aren't any weapons that purposefully put you at a direct disadvantage, but through various cosmetic effects or random oversights, there are certainly a couple that end up being worse versions than their counterparts. The Sharp Dresser, for instance, is a pretty neat knife. It has cool animations and sound effects that are unique to the weapon, which would be amazing if it also had a taunt kill to go along with them. I know Spy's fencing taunt kill isn't exactly close to the game's meta, but come on, don't take out a fun part of his kit without giving him anything in return. Also in the Valve couldn't be bothered to make the taunt kill animations bin are the stock melee reskins. Wait, hold on, didn't I just say that they're direct upgrades? Well, in most circumstances they are, because a majority of stock melees don't have associated taunt kills. But in the case of Heavy, you actually do lose out on the showdown taunt, which is, as we say in the industry, a bummer. The capper gives away your location much easier because of its brighter tracers, the app sap and the snack attack make significantly more passive noise than the stock sapper, Hello. and if the loading screen tips are to be believed, the frying pan alerts all nearby enemies that you've entered their base, so it's probably safe to put these on the list too. As for the direct downgrade cosmetics, there actually are several that have a negative stat listed on them. The most common ones are the Christmas hats with a stat jingle all the way, which adds a sleigh bell sound to each of your footsteps. Each hat has a slightly different pitch and volume to the jingle sound effect, so you're actually getting screwed over in different calibers depending on which gimmick hat you end up picking. But ironically, even though Valve considers this to be a direct downgrade, I personally don't. If a spy is disguised as someone wearing the jingle all the way cosmetic, they won't produce the jingle noise when they walk, meaning that there's now a surefire way to detect whether that player is a spy. And as for how badly the sound effect gives you away, I'd say the differences are minimal, actually. I wear an unusual rain unicorn in 80% of my loadouts, and I really don't notice myself dying more with it than without it. So overall, I consider this one to be more of a positive, but I'll leave it for the viewers to decide. Oh, and I'll also throw in both of these cosmetics into the makes your walking like five times louder category because they also change the footstep noise to something much more obvious. And last but certainly least, the Bamanamacon is the bane of dead ringing spies everywhere, not only completely giving away that you're still alive, but also showing everyone your exact location for the entire duration of the explosion effect fun. In a game like TF2, certain weapons and cosmetics are bound to accidentally give people an advantage. It's hard to have a 15-year-old game with thousands of unique items and keep all of them completely consistent 100% of the time. And really, with the exception of the looping taunts, I think Valve has done a pretty good job with it. Most of the quote-unquote pay-to-win items are only better by a very slim margin down to the point where it's nitpicking at most. But regardless, I figured that compiling a list of which items are technically direct upgrades would be cool, so here you go. If you think that there are any direct upgrade items that I I missed, feel free to comment below. There were a couple that I purposely left out of the video because I didn't think that they were direct upgrades, but I'd still be curious to hear your feedback regardless. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like. If you hated this video, you're probably a real life nerd emoji, and most importantly, have a good one.